My name is Max Zhang. I am the chair of the committee uh, of the Philodemic Society's Committee on Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation. And I'm so honored to welcome you all to our panel tonight, Memorialization in Our Physical Spaces, Confronting Legacies of Slavery, where we'll talk with these three esteemed professors here at Georgetown uh, about how we think about veneration uh, in the 21st century um, and reconciling with the big questions around slavery, um, specifically in terms of Georgetown and in terms of philodemics history. So um, we're gonna start with just some opening remarks from each of them. Uh, I'll just ask each of them to introduce themselves and then we'll just go down the line with their opening remarks. So we have Professor Adam Rothman, we have Professor Sawika Colbert, uh, Colbert and Dr. Uh, Maurice Jackson. So yeah, um, do you wanna get us started, Professor Rothman? Sure. Thanks, Max. Yes. Um, my name is Adam Rothman. I teach history here. Um, I am now the director of Georgetown's new Center for the Study of Slavery and its Legacies. And uh, since I was a member of Georgetown's working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation in 2015, 2016, and since then I've been teaching a class called Facing Georgetown's History, uh, which which really focuses on slavery and its legacies here at the university. Uh, I really want to, I want to say two things. Uh, one is about the role of students in the slavery memory and reconciliation process. And the second is about our relationship to our, uh, to our school's history. So first, about students. Students have been so important to the Slavery Memory and Reconciliation Initiative from the very beginning, in a way from before the very beginning, back to the 1980s and 1990s when students in the American Studies program, along with faculty, began to excavate the history of slavery at the university, laying a foundation for what came later. Uh, my own knowledge about the history of the philodemic society's connections to slavery comes from students as well, specifically Jonathan Marrow, who's here, John's right over there, who is, uh, did a senior th honors thesis in history in 2017, 2018, about the history of the philodemic society using the philodemic society's incredible archives I mean, one of the things that's really remarkable about Georgetown's history is how well documented it is. Uh, and once you start digging around, you can find real treasures. And I think the Philodemic Society records are part of that. So one of the things Jonathan did was he went through the minutes of the early Philodemic Society and identified all of the debates having to do with slavery and race and many other topics. And I just, I'm sure many of you in the room are familiar with the debates that took place. But uh, I just want to mention a few of them. On December 12th, 1830, one of, the, one of the first debates that the Philodemic Society held, the topic was, should slaves be liberated? That's how it's recorded in the minutes. And the outcome of that debate was that the question was decided in the negative. In other words, the Philodemic students decided that slaves should not be liberated. And there were several other debates about the abolition of slavery before the Civil War. Uh, there were also debates about secession in the 1850s, uh, some for, some against. Um, but it's a, it's a wonderful index of both the attitudes and the debates among students here at Georgetown around the questions of slavery uh, before the Civil War. And reading through the titles of those debates and the outcomes, one of the things that strikes me the most uh, is, the, is ultimately the limits of debate to resolve the central question <coughs> of slavery in American history uh, was resolved by a terrible war, which shows us what's hap what happens when debate is insufficient or when debate breaks down. And one of the lessons of that is just how important debate really is, how important 
the, the, the thing that the philodemic society does is to society, and it's worth remembering that. So that's what I want to say about, about students. Um, the, the second thing I want to say is just about our relationship to history. And I think the Philodemic Society room and the Philodemic Society's history is a really good uh, microcosm of this problem. I really believe that we all need to learn to live with our history. We need to learn to live with our history. And I don't mean that in a complacent kind of way. We all do, in fact, live with our history every day without necessarily knowing it or being aware that it's all around us. But I mean learning to live with our history in a very active, engaged, and conscious way. So knowing what the names on the buildings mean, being aware of the iconography in places like the Philodemic Society room, and finding a way to learn from the the residue of this history that, that's around us. And that doesn't mean necessarily leaving things as they are, always. It can mean, it can mean changing things if they just don't make sense anymore. But I think that we have to be careful before we do that, not to lose a sense of history in the first place. So I, would, I think one of the guiding principles always ought to be how can we learn to live with our history? Thank you, Dr. Rothman. Dr. Colbert? Thank you. It's always a pleasure to have an opportunity to have a conversation and to learn from Professor Rothman, Professor Jackson. Um, I'm Sawika Colbert. I am a faculty member in the African American Studies and Performing Arts departments, and I'm currently the Vice President of Interdisciplinary Initiatives. Um, and I was on the committee that helped to formulate the idea for the Racial Justice Institute. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about art and culture and world making. Um, most recently, I curated an exhibit at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And the reason I'm raising this, this um, point of reference is because I think it Ha offers us another entry point into the idea of living with history. So I want to read you a quote that was very helpful for me when I was an undergrad here at Georgetown um, in the late 90s and early aughts. Um, and it's from Toni Morrison. She writes, there is no place you or I can go to summon the presences of or recollect the absences of slaves. There is no suitable memorial or plaque or wreath or wall or park or skyscraper lobby. There's no 300 foot tower. There's no small bench by the road. And because such a place doesn't exist, the book had to. So this is Toni Morrison speaking about her award-winning novel, Beloved, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 1988 on this day. Um, and so the African American history, the Museum of African American History and Culture posted that quote today because at the time Morrison made the comment, the museum didn't exist. And so one of the things I think is useful for us having this conversation is really thinking about the distinction between, if there is one, of living with history and what types of histories we honor by building skyscrapers, rooms, museums, in order for us to understand and to engage with them. And I also think as a literary scholar, it's useful for us to consider the distinction between sites of memory and sites of history and how we might wrestle with that distinction. And so the final piece that I would offer in really thinking about our own relationship to Georgetown in the past, because I think it's also important for us to recognize local histories and how they manifest themselves, is that when I was a student here, um, it was like a really poorly kept secret that George of the 272. And so as a faculty member, when the New York Times broke the story decades later, it was surprising to me, colleagues coming up to me from other universities wanting to know what I thought about this past and how did I feel. And it was a strange, um, 
orientation to the past because I had known it since I was an undergrad in the 90s. And so I say that only to say that the Philip Demick Room's history in particular has a certain resonance for us as a community here at Georgetown that I think is different than the outside world. And as you're grappling with how to understand that past, I think it's important to think about our own communal relationship to that past in history, as well as the larger way it animates global conversations. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, th thank you all for having me. Uh, thanks, Max. And it's a pleasure always to be uh, on a stage with my uh, colleagues uh, here. Y you know, when, when uh, uh, and I, I teach in the history department, I teach Atlantic history, but I've lately been teaching uh, uh, in, in the Doha campus in, in Qatar, uh, mainly because it gives the opportunity to teach young people from 30, 40 countries of the developing world. And you know, you know you make a difference there because you're teaching really, future, as we teach here, future leaders uh, uh, of the world. And I spend a lot of time teaching also now in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the, in the prison. Uh, last week I went to teach to the prison and uh, the DC jail and I uh, go in and I see about a hundred white people there and I've, I'm very upset about gentrification in Washington DC. It's, it's bothersome to me that, uh, that black people are being pushed out. So I see and I say, damn, they're taking over the jail too. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realize that they aren't nicely dressed people uh, like you or they were. And they were you know, just different. And then I realized that they were the husbands and wives of the Proud Boys uh, uh, there. And as you know, you saw yesterday that Miss Green, the lady from uh, uh, Georgia, went in and visited it. And uh, they were condemning. And then one guy from Texas says, well, you know, actually, the D.C. jails are much better off than they are in Texas. Well, I go there and they're a jail, a jail. You know, once that door clings on and closes, it just makes you shake. Uh, when, when Dr. DeJoy, President DeJoy asked all of us to be on this committee to discuss slavery and, 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 and the names and things like that, I first demurred a little bit because I thought, you're the president, let's do it. It's, 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 we've, been, we've gone over this for decades and decades. And then I realized that <clears throat> he had a purpose and the purpose was to generate a discussion so that we could come to conclusion, it wouldn't be forced upon anybody. It'd be a conclusion, a debate, uh, 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 you know, about the importance of this. Now, right now, I'm, I'm, I keep saying it, and every time I think I'm within a page finish, I, something else happens, so I keep adding, but I'm trying to finish a, a book on Washington. And what I find is the most interesting thing is not just a, because of Washington, but I'm looking at Washington as a product of the nation. I have no interest in just writing about Washington, but Washington is an indicative. And as I look, Washington is founded on slavery. Lock, stock, and barrel. When they make the decision to, to, to make the capital here, it's for two things. First, that the North would have helped assume the Southern debt. And the second thing, that it would satisfy slave makers, slave owners. And George Washington would accept the site. George Washington lives in Mount Vernon. He never lived in Washington. He lives there in Mount Vernon. He has 123 slaves. His wife, Martha, has 124. She manumits her, he manumits his slaves upon death. She never does. So the nation is founded. 13 of the, uh, 14 of the first 15 presidents owned slaves. Lincoln didn't in one of them. And most of the people who owned slaves, when they had the White House, they brought them here. The nation is built uh, you know, upon slavery. Georgetown is built upon slavery, as, as you all are studying with, with, with Professor Rothman. And so as we look, I, I was looking at the, the letter someone sent to me, and it said uh, such and such, and Henry Clay or Calhoun, they were anti-slavery. Well, there was no such thing. These men weren't. You could not want slavery in your city. It doesn't mean you're anti-slavery. It just means you didn't want to see black people. It, it's, and many of these people joined, formed the American, anti formed the American Colonization Society, and the American Colonization Society had one purpose, and that is to send free blacks to Liberia because free blacks could be used. They thought free blacks, if they're literate, they would be used to aid other people getting freedom. And so the history of, 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 of this university, of course, you know, and I think maybe if you all have read the, uh, the article by Professor, I think Malachi, that goes into John Gaston and the first graduate devout uh, a slave owner. And everywhere you look, you look. Someone mentioned Randolph. Randolph said, uh, 
uh, uh, someone was, he said, that man, that picture, George Washington, uh, he owned slaves. He's a great American. And so owning slaves was a virtue. But at a certain point, it had to stop being a virtue. At a certain point, racism was a virtue. But no longer is it, well, among some, it's, it's no longer a virtue. So we look at, and as I think about this, it, 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 we have so many examples of people, I could just give you quote after quote, of African Americans who played such a role in this city, making this country. Two weeks ago, they had a, a, a memorial for a man named Yaw Mahmoud. He lives up the street, 34th and, and Dent Street. A man who had come from Guinea at the age of 16, enslaved until he was in his 50s, bought his slavery, saved up to buy his slavery, long, gave the money to a white man to save for him. The white man stole it, did it again. I don't know why he did it again. Gave it, the white man stole it, finally put it in the bank. But he couldn't be on the board of directors of the bank, but he bought his freedom and, uh, and bought the freedom of his family. What an example that we can look. Uh, the city is now, is, 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 uh, is, 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 uh, Engineer is a survey by a man named Benjamin Banneker. Benjamin Banneker, he thinks, because his name is Banneke, which, which was his, uh, his, 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 his father's name, born in Africa, free. And I read the letter that he writes to Thomas Jefferson. And he writes, I'm a proud black, and uh, I have done so much to this country. Please give my race their freedom. And Jefferson demurs at first and accepts the letter. But then he's criticized, and so then he says, well, he couldn't have read it, written it by himself. He did not have, though the man could, it was literate and could read and write. But the man played a great role in surveying the capital after, you know, after L'Enfant, who had been brought here to do it, was dismissed by Washington. Dismissed by Washington because he was anti-slave, but because Washington wanted him to, to sell private property and sell the capital, and the capital was the Beely. But it's sit here because the Southerners and so here we live in a place. And if you go back and then you come back around now, you can see why I'm so upset about this gentrification. Because you start off at a certain point, you think you move forward, and then all of a sudden, one step forward, one step back. So I was thinking about those two people. And then I thought about another person who ended up here in Washington. Her name was Sojourner Truth. And many of you all know the stories of Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. You know her for Ain't I a Woman. But what we didn't know about her is that she came here to work as a nurse and she worked uh, in, 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 uh, at the reconstruction camps and when she wanted to get on a, a subway they, uh, a tr tram they pulled off and broke her arm and she's a big lady even though she was here to help nurse soldiers and they asked her one question and she said this that America owes the Negro a big debt that can never be repaid. Now, what did she mean by that? She meant that, of course, a debt is old, but you can never repay the debt of a, of, of a million souls that you've robbed and beaten and raped and repined. So the debate now is pretty minimal. It's about changing pictures and, 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 and changing names, but it's also about trying to create a society that recognizes people is equal always, that recognizes the, the, the sufferings of a people, but also recognizes that all that comes back to where we are today. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Um, I think this theme about the insufficiency of reconciliation seems really important to me. Um, and I wonder if you could all speak more towards how we can participate in this project knowing that it's incomplete. Like, what does reconciliations mean when it can, true reconciliations can never be accomplished? Like, why is it still so important for us to engage in this work? And what does that look like? You can go in any order. <laughs> Me? Yeah. Um, uh, okay, um, a, few, a few things. The first is, I think the fact that a reconciliation or a closure or a conclusion can never really be complete is actually quite liberating. It means that you can, there's a lot of things you could do. There's any, you can do, any, do anything yeah. and it's meaningful. Uh, you don't have to worry about solving 
solving the problem. You can just chip away at fixing it a little bit, and that's helpful. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing I would say is we have a couple of models of reconciliation in Georgetown's history and in <coughs> the way that Georgetown has been reckoning with its history recently. I just talked with my class about this uh, this week, so it's fresh in my mind. And the two models I have in mind are, first of all, the Catholic sacrament of reconciliation, which is about your relation, about atoning for your sins to God. That's one form of reconciliation. The other form of reconciliation is embedded in our very problematic school colors, blue and gray, which I, I'm always surprised to discover many students don't know the meaning of. While the school colors were adopted in 1876 by the rowing team to uh, identify themselves out on the Potomac, but also to signify the reconciliation between northern and southern students at the school. So the blue is the, is the United States and the gray is the Confederacy. So that is a model, that is a kind of reconciliation. They were seeking peace after war, and there's something very honorable about that, except that that, that that reconciliation came to a great extent at expense of African Americans. And so that reconciliation was incomplete. And we now have to you know, st stitch that together in a different way again. So those are models of reconciliation that arise out of Georgetown's history and identity and can help us think about what we can and can't do. So I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about three different models of reconciliation. So the first is <coughs> one of the gifts of having relationships with people, functional relationships with people over decades, is that you have a lot of chance to practice reconciliation. And I sometimes think about dynamics or relationships that I'm in that don't have the capacity to really reconcile across differences. And so in The Fire Next Time, um, the last bit of James Baldwin's epic essay, which you should all read before you graduate. If you're seniors, there's still time. But he ends the essay by saying that the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks need to come together like lovers to save our country. And I always ask my students, why does he say lovers? Mm. Why does he use that word? And so part of why I think Baldwin uses the word lovers is because much of the fire next time is contemplating the lack of trust, the lack of intimacy, the lack of vulnerability, and what overcoming racial injustice requires of both sides in the way that Baldwin is framing it is having a level of trust, intimacy, um, and vulnerability, which is essential to most loving relationships and I would argue is part of how you have to come to reconciliation. And so mm -hmm. there has to be a fundamental letting go of your defenses in order to reconcile. The other example that I'll give is I was recently, thank you Georgetown in South Africa, with the Racial Justice Institute, and of course, some of you might be familiar with their history of reconciliation, which talking to folks on the ground is not, was not as successful as their PR might have you believe. Yes. And again, this is part of the reason is because there wasn't this, there wasn't truth telling, there wasn't really mm. grappling with the realities of the situation that are in front of us and the difficult truths that we all have to encounter. And so I would offer that as a second example. And Again, returning to the fundamental question of how are we going to live with the reality of our situation. The last is a quote from a friend and colleague um, at Northwestern, Josh Chambers Letson, that talks about how we might get over harm, trauma. And what he posits in his writing is that there often is no way to mend certain ruptures in relationships and dynamics and our hearts but the goal is to put ourselves back together enough so that we can move forward. Mm. And so I think that, you know, just piggybacking on what Professor Rothman said, I don't think the goal necessarily 
First of all, I don't think it's possible to get over slavery, but I don't think that that should be our goal. Our goal should be how we can move forward together, given the shared history that we have, and think about what does it mean as a community to work daily to live in an ethical relationship to what came before us. Thank you. Um, yeah, a great German uh, philosopher once said in a debate that, that the, uh, the struggle is everything, the, the, uh, the goal is nothing. And it sounds very good, but it's really quite silly because you get tired of struggling. Why do you struggle if you don't have a goal? The striving is to, is, is to get something, so you have to have a goal. Right. And, 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 and we would hope in the goal is, is the elimination of racism and creating a society where you don't have to go. And you realize the difficulty of it. Almost every day, I go in my office and put my head down. I have seen the most asinine things said. Just everyday racism. You just, and I'm a pretty tough guy. But I, can you never, as I say, you never see me sweat. You never know it. But I'm going to. And it, and so you have that on one hand, but also you know what the great possibilities are. And the possibilities at a place like this, because it's such a serene place. So nobody's going to lynch you. You're not going to have any of that problem. But you're going to have the other, which are even, and you have an administration that is, that is supportive. But you do have these uh, 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 particular goals, and you can, in a way, reach them. I t let me give you an example. We had COVID last year. Yeah, and of course you know that. <laughs> in one year, the government wants you to do, and you know what happened in one year? You know what happened? Poverty was eliminated. Nobody didn't get a check. Nobody starved. People were given money for rents and things like that helped. And there were problems, of course. And then after one year, what happened? It came right back because the government stopped. So we know we can solve problems. You know you can solve, you just have to have the, as my grandma said, where there's a will, there's a way. And you know there's the money. And so what we have to do is figure out a way to, 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 to put our money where our mouths is to solve the particular problems. And of course the university can't do it all. But besides now, we have many cities now uh, I think in California and other places, they have reparation movements and things like that. Dick America back there has talked about this uh, uh, for many years. But we have to have a particular way to create some bodies that are going to determine in, in, a, in, 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 a, in a macro way of what we did here at the, here at the university. In the university, if, if you've read the, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the report we did, and it, it says at a certain point, uh, including uh, it's not, we don't use the word, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, renew, it's not remunerations, but including uh, adjustments, including some form of repertory justice. And that's the term now. Did it mean money? No, of course. It, it, it probably didn't. Universities don't give money away. Universities give scholarships and things like that. But they, and so, but, but how, and this is where the debate comes. So we can do a lot. And the Racial Justice Institute and things like that. You see, for me, you can never do enough. Everything we do at this school is fine, but it's so slow. It's so bad. Racial justice is all this, and you can you, you want to know what's happening right away. But you have these dilemmas, and the problem is to, to the big thing is to prepare you all for the world. That's that. That's the point. And the prayer for you all for the world to go out and solve these big problems, and you know what they are, because if you live in Washington D.C., you know injustice is everywhere. You can see it. You can see it in, 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 in the prices of, uh, of insulin. Mm. You can see it in, in, in the prices of, of, uh, of, of now, if you have COVID, before it was free, and, and, and now if you don't have insurance, you have to pay $100, but you don't have the insurance. You see it in everywhere. So the problem is to do that. And the first issue of the day would be, lastly, you all will have a big dilemma because what is the Supreme Court going to do? Mm. And if it does, I don't know. But here's the question. You all have been made wonderful young individuals, wonderful human beings, tolerant because of affirmative action. Because you've been, you know, I, 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 some people ask me about it and, and I joke and I'll have a young white kid and say, well, what about him? He's not, he hasn't done anything for me. So I give him two words, I give him three words. You know what they are? <coughs> ask your mama. <laughs> because affirmative action has done so much to elevate the condition of white women, to break the glass ceiling. I'm not against it, I'm for it. And other things, the question of, uh, of title, title nine, you know, of women in sports, 
the question of equity and, and, and other things, of hiring things like that. And the dilemma comes, and this is going to be a big dilemma because if it is, it's going to drastically change the university and drastically change society. And these schools, the presidents are saying, oh, we're creating funds. To, they, they can't do it. They're not going to have the funds to do it because it's going to really decimate. It's going to change the situation. So all of this is a part of the bigger struggle around racial justice and about doing as much as you can to help the least of these. Thank you, Professor Jackson. Um, I do want to talk very specifically about questions of veneration. And that's something the society and the committee specifically has really uh, confronted in that there are very physical symbols of the Confederacy, <coughs> of slavery, that live in our room and have lived in our room uh, over the years in which we've been in the philodemic room downstairs. Um, do you see a meaningful difference between preserving a history and venerating it? And on the note of veneration, how do we choose individuals to venerate, given that you know, all of us live with complex histories? Perhaps we'll start with Professor Jackson. I don't start to this way. <laughs> or Professor Colbert, if you would like. So I would say um, that there is a difference between veneration and living with history. Um, and I would make perhaps the radical claim that if it were my choosing, we would probably not venerate any individuals. Mm. So I recently wrote a book about um, a playwright named Lorraine Hansberry who is known for having the first play, play by a black woman on Broadway. And one, Hansberry was a intellectual, a spokesperson, she was a civil rights activist, she was a playwright, um, and of all of her different roles in society, the one that she was most uncomfortable with was being a spokesperson mm. because she thought that mass movements for change happen through mass movements. And so that focusing on an individual misrepresented what was actually happening to transform society. Mm. And so whenever she was in the position of someone asking for her to speak for a group, for an organization, that she worked with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, CORE, SELC, all of the big civil rights organizations. She was picketing, <laughs> writing letters, fundraising. She was doing all of the work that we would associate with prototypical activism. So when people would ask her to speak about an issue, her signature move was to always redirect attention to the, the grassroots activists who she thought was doing the work on the ground. And so she used the spotlight to redirect it on masses of people. And so for me personally, I think that we could spend more time thinking about the masses of people that are transforming society on a day-to-day -day basis and the way that we build more ethical structures through our daily activities rather than these big moments that become the storylines for our historical books and so forth. Um, but I understand that that might not be a popular opinion. So I would say <laughs> if you want to put a person on the wall, then you just have to live with the reality that one day you might have to take them down. And, that, and that's okay too. And so there are certainly people who have done things that I think in terms of our historical narrative stand out more than others. And so aligning your, the philodemic society's you know, politics and or mission with highlighting those individuals might be one way of thinking about how to do this work in real time. And, you know, and what are you honoring? What is the purpose of having these figures on the wall? What are you celebrating? What are you calling attention to? What types of histories are you really investing in? And not only you're putting them on the wall, but also memorializing them for next, the generations of Hoyas to come, right? Because that's part of the work of curating this space that you're doing and understanding that 50 years from now, one of your future class, your future alum may decide to take the person down. So the last thing that I'll say is there's this lovely speech in Hansberry's most well-known well play, A Raise in the Sun, where um, an African exchange student is talking to one of the main characters about revolution. Mm -hmm. And she basically tells him that, you know, he's an idealist and he doesn't know what he's talking about. And he tells her that when he goes home, he's going to be one of the only people in his village that knows how to read and he'll fight for justice. And at some point, years from now, there might be another revolutionary that comes and displaces him. And that that's fine. 
And so Hansberry understood that freedom was a day-to-day -day practice and that it evolved over time. And so similarly, and I think this was some, similar, just echoing something that Adam said earlier, similarly, history is something that we understand through its unfolding, and those who we might want to honor today, there's nothing wrong with us reevaluating that in a later point. Gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm, as a historian, not very into veneration. Mm. Um, it's not really a stance that lends itself to inquiry or understanding or critical judgment or anything like that. Um, I want to, so if Calhoun's on the ceiling, um, I want to know who he was, what he did, why he did it, and why he's up there. Like, at what point in at what point in history did somebody make a decision to, you know, to idolize him or to make him uh, part of the pantheon of eloquence in American history? And uh, um, I might I might decide now that I, I mean, that I understand I understand why he's why somebody put him there. I wouldn't have done it myself, but uh, <coughs> there are lessons to be learned from him. So. I could kind of give or take, give him or take him. It doesn't really matter to me. I think that as a, a, a historian, I ha, I can I can give myself some critical distance, some some iron. There's a kind of irony, and I, to my relationship to these these statues and portraits, and I don't. I mean, that's, that's my relationship. That's, that's how I kind of learn to live with this history, by approaching them critically, trying to understand why they're there, and then figure out what I can learn from that. I guess that's my, that would be my approach. Professor Jackson. You know, the, uh, the great Cuban liberator, Jose Marti, said that all the glory in the world can be put in the kernel of corn. And what he meant by that, it's, it's obviously, you, you, you know, what he meant by that. But at the same time, we have to look at certain particular issues. I'll give you an example. When Dr. King died, everybody waited for the next great leader. But it wasn't coming. And another king wasn't coming like that. But does that not mean you need leaders? Well, of course you do. Of course you need. I'm not talking the great man three and all that, but of course you need. But it doesn't mean you put them on a, a certain pedestal, but you need people to play roles and people who will come out of, you know, I, I grew up knowing Angela Davis and I saw her, you know, when she went to prison and went to the FBI list and all this stuff and all the struggles she went to and now whatever age she is now, the young people have this model. They don't have an awful lot, but have this model of this woman who went through all that and still out there fighting. And, and if you ask any young black person now, because the Afro that she wore in 1970 is coming back. Well, so you sort of appreciate that. Me, who do I adore? I adore jazz musicians. So, uh, 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 you know, and jazz musicians, if you know any, can be the most rotten human beings in the world. <laughs> I mean, I have a son named Miles. Now, we didn't name him after Miles. I would name a child after Miles Davis. <laughs> Miles Davis was not a person I'd want to. But they're so creative. And they have the limits, and they know that. So, but you have the appreciation of that. So not long ago, I went to U Street, and a young woman was doing a mural. And she came to my house, they have all these pictures, and she did a mural of all the great jazz musicians from DC. You know, Duke Ellington, Shirley Horn, Buck Hill, all the great ones, and others. Well, that's something. Can, so we understand what the, what the role they play in society. Around here at the university, you know, the, the problem is, is that, uh, you know, history often finds out their weaknesses later on. Right. And we can certainly find, for example, uh, 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 in, in studying the Georgetown, we certainly have to go back because Georgetown didn't admit women to a certain point. So why doesn't? And of course, you have buildings named after you start changing names, Gaston, Gaston owned slaves, you start doing that. So you got to go all the way down the list. But is it worth discussing? Of course it is. Uh, uh, but understand that as you discuss it, some pain is going to come out because you're going to realize that uh, that you've been idolizing someone who, and it happens. It, it happens in every every city. It happens in every 
leadership it happens. So. I wanna, can I add two things? Yeah, of course. So first of all, since Professor Jackson said he idolizes <laughs> jazz musicians, I, wanna do, I do want to confess that I, I idolize Jewish professional athletes. <laughs> <laughs> That's my. All right. I put them on my. Yeah, yeah, right. um, but the but there is a problem. Like even the great figures, the figures every <coughs> the figures everybody can agree are great. Like Dr. King, we now have a holiday named after Doc. It's a national holiday, but the price of that was a total evacuation of his political principle principles, the, the fight that he was engaged in. So we have the most anodyne, the most innocuous um, understanding of King that is the King that's subject of the public's veneration. But the, but the real King and the movement that he was a part of gets, you know, gets dismissed, gets forgotten. And so we've forgotten the most important thing about the person we were trying to remember. Or of Abraham Lincoln, you know, that we know that's great, but, it, but, but the, the, the more we read, the more we realize the, the, the flaws he had, but he saved the nation. So he realized that now we see that he, his position on colonization and all this. And of course, uh, he, uh, he, he, it just goes across the board. So we have to be, but Adam is right with King, we find out that his image you know, I had a student the other day, and I was at the first of the year. No matter what, you have to do the first reading on King. And what do we do here? We have a concert. I used to go. I don't go now, mainly because you have to get there at four o'clock to hear a ten o'clock concert. And if it's John Coltrane, you don't know who John Coltrane is. He's a great. If he's coming to play, then I'll go at four o'clock. But John Coltrane is not going to be there. He's been dead for fifty years. <laughs> so, but at any rate, so you have. You, but so I so one kid said, I didn't know that he uh, that he gave more speeches than I have a dream. I gave him about five speeches: the Vietnam speech, the anti-poverty speech, all the speeches, time to break silence, and all these. And this kid said, this young man said, I didn't. And I thought, at a certain point, you have to take responsibility. At a certain point, you can't say, Mama didn't give me this speech. At a certain point, you have to say, I have to go out and give this speech. And that is the king that we forgotten about because we had been taught but we have to go and search you as young people the radical king which is quite phenomenal speaking of student responsibility would love to hear some student <laughs> questions for our wonderful guests if anyone wants to raise their hand we have mics uh, right here oh, sure okay. hi uh, again thank you all for uh, coming out um, so something that I think the Philadelphia Society has really been contending with was and has been getting diverse voices, particularly as of now, we have no black members of the Philadelphia Society, particularly because of the reputation that we have. And so my question is, how do we get people from all these diverse backgrounds to be involved in the conversation of improving our society without expecting them to educate us? What is, your ex, what is your average discussion on? What is your average debate on in, in the society? It varies. Sometimes political, sometimes more philosophical debates. Yeah. And do you debate issues that you think people who are of color or something like that would want to be involved in? Outside of just a purely philosophical debate, you know, I, I, I you know, I, 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 I'm lucky. I read a lot of philosophy, so I know, you know, the, you know, you know, the, uh, the debates. You know, if you take Hume, who said, uh, "I've never seen uh, there are no people of color who are worthy of being called a human being," or Locke about selling uh, uh, about his his view of, of of human beings as chattel and things like that. But have you ever thought about taking issues like that and then breaking them down to modern things, a discussion, discussion on poverty, a discussion where, where, where people can come but not feel like they're the victims, uh, where you can discuss poverty or race, but a kid not feel that you were just discussing them? You, you, uh, listen to this. This is what uh, Frederick Douglass says. No man can put a chain around the ankle of his fellow man without at last finding the other end fastened around his neck. And what's he saying? He's talking about racism. He's saying what racism has done 
to society as a whole. And discussion how racism has affects blacks, whites rather, the soul, the mind. When you think, how can a people think what some people are thinking now about a person of a different color? So I would say, you know, it, it, it maybe have issues that really can, that people, because you have blacks who are studying philosophy. You have black, I have black kids who are studying philosophy and other things like that who come and discuss or history, things like that. But it may be the issues. I, I don't know the answer to that, but it may be just the issues. And uh, have some good free food. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, have some cultural activities. There you go. Like diverse populations. There I mean, go. I guess the other thing that I would say is, as a group, I think you have to welcome the fact that you might feel uncomfortable at some times mm -hmm. and that that's okay. Mm -hmm. And that there will be growing pains and that you, because when you're creating more space, then you're changing the dynamic of the core group, right? So that's like an inherent part of creating more space. And so in, in so doing, there's gonna be times where the current membership feels uncomfortable <laughs> because you're changing something about how the group is functioning. And I think really being clear with yourselves about that can also be helpful. But, you know, more pragmatic things are um, in August, next August, all of our students of color who come into, what is that thing you all have on the lawn and you invite people to come in your clubs? Like a uh, cab fare? Yes. They don't know. So you can maybe put your table right next to the uh, BSA table <laughs> and y'all can make friends. And you can say when you sign up on their list, sign up over here. We're all friends here together. Um, and you can get them before they even know about the, the history and so forth and so on. Jonah. Yes, uh, Professor Rothman, you talked about living with history. And I think being here at Georgetown, you definitely get a sense of history. We're, we're always talking about how this is the oldest Jesuit university in the country. And certainly in the Philadelphic Society, we trade on our history a lot. We're always talking about how we're the oldest secular student organization um, and all of these events way back in our history that we do claim and that we're proud of. But in the case of both Georgetown and the Philadelphic Society, that history also includes a very deep legacy of bigotry, of connections with slavery. That's not just one small part. I mean, with Georgetown, it owes its existence and its survival to the sale of 272 enslaved people. And with the Philadelphic Society, dozens of those early debates weren't just about slavery as a sort of political issue. If you go back in the record, there are also plenty of debates that just talk about the issue of race in really horrible and insensitive ways. But now, as we're doing this work, are we fooling ourselves if we try to claim just the good parts of our history, but disavow those other parts? And I also want to add, does that mean, does claiming that history mean we have to abide by the decisions of our predecessors? Like, do we have to respect the reasoning that they had when they put John Calhoun in the ceiling? Or, uh, Professor Colbert, is it like what you said, we just have to accept that sometimes we're going to have to take the people down. So when I said that we have to learn to live with our history, uh, I, I really mean that we need to learn to live with our whole history and not just the, not just the good parts. That's, that's what we've been doing. Uh, we, we have a very rich landscape of historical memory at a place like Georgetown, but for, but it, for a long time it was a highly manicured landscape, very selective that you know, left out a lot of things. So if you're not telling the whole truth, then you're partially lying to others and to yourself. So um, I, I think just um, as a matter of telling the truth, that's an important principle. That's what yeah. we should do. Uh, and that means telling the whole truth. And that means facing things that can be very uncomfortable about our past, things we're not proud of at all. Um, but if you don't confront those things, then you are living a half, a half truth, which is as good as a lie. So I think, uh, and I think there's a lot to learn from paying attention to the terrible things that have gone on. Um, not so much uh, in the sense that we should um, be too judgmental about things that went on in the past. President DeJoya often talks about using the history to expand our own moral imaginations. So what are the things that we're not seeing around us? You know, what are the decisions that we're making that are, that are harmful to people that we're not thinking about, uh, both personally but as a university? 
Um, so that's one of the kinds of lessons that we can draw from history to look at our own world with a kind of new and, and broader horizon. And I think that is, that's one of the good things about looking at the bad things in history. You don't need to, I mean, there is no, there is no law or obligation or duty to uh, make the same mistakes people made 100 years ago. We're not bound by them. We can make different choices. Um, but we should inform ourselves about the kinds of choices that they made in the first place. Could, could I give an example ahead of yeah. this? So tomorrow I go to the, to, to the D.C. jail. And uh, I had volunteered at Lorden before, and they were, they, it, it, it was all black men. And, and, and uh, it was always uh, maximum security, which means, you know, they probably aren't going to get out for a while. And you never ask the person what they're in there for because you just don't want to know what kind of awful they did something against a woman. But tomorrow, and this is not maximum security, and here they're women. I've never had taught women in the prison, and they're whites. And it's just unusual, and it's, it's just lovely. And we got a couple of comedians in class. But tomorrow we discuss a book called Tally's Corner. And Tally's Corner is a book that was written about a street corner in Washington, about black men on the street corner. And it's about the wrong decisions they made. And so tomorrow it's going to be pretty tough for these guys. Now I grew up, you know, uh, my grandmother raised me, so my mother, there was no father around. They, they separated when I was very young. So I understand. I had a brother who went to prison. It's not, you know, what the great historian says is uh, nothing that it, uh, 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 nothing in history is alien to me, which means I've seen many, uh, uh, many aspects of life. But they're going to have to confront a reality. They're going to have to confront it with each other. And I'm just, I'm looking forward to it because I think they're going to do it well. If they, if, if, if they won't just in a person, but they're going to look at the mistakes they made as men, uh, you know, in the obligations of families and things like that. It's going to be painful in a, in a sense, but it's going to be enlightening because I'm hoping and I, that's why I've given them two weeks to discuss it, to think about it, and to see. And everybody has those type. And so it's not to make anybody feel guilty. That's not the point. The point is to just look and see what errors people have made and how we can make ourselves and make society better. That's, if, it, if it wasn't for that, a debate means nothing. If it's not going to help improve somebody's life, it's just useless. At least to me, it's useless. So. But I do, I mean, I do think there's a dis, an important distinction, and this is for the society to, to grapple with further, but I do think there's an important distinction between living with a robust and full history and venerating individuals from the past. And so I do think the act of a museum, of memorializing <coughs> certain parts of our history serves a different function than the active grappling with that Adam is describing, which doesn't mean that you can't grapple with figures that are venerated, that we, ha we have statues to or whatever, or whatever, but I do think that those, it's important to distinguish between those two activities. Yeah. Has anybody been, have you all been to the African American Museum? Have you all been? And you go to the section on slavery, yeah? And then you go upstairs and you see a Klan room. And it's painful, but it's necessary to see. It's part of his, not it's just showing. It's a good way of you know, not just the glory, but it's that. And it's painful for a black person to go. So a lot of black folks say, why you got this in there? But it's necessary to have. Because the museum is for white people to understand history, it's history too. So. Um, student question over here. And we'll do Elena, and then I think we'll have to wrap up probably for time. Okay, go ahead. okay um, <coughs> so both Professor Rothman and Professor Colbert, you guys mentioned kind of how you're not the biggest fans of veneration um, and like that it's the voice of the people and like the mass movements that are more important. But do you think that veneration can be an important tool if you to kind of like offset the white men that have been like venerated in the philodemic room for decades upon decades? So like because of that, should we try to venerate other people in order to kind of balance that out? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, no, so I, I, am, I, I would love to. Uh, no, Toni Morrison. She's not a debater, though. Go ahead. Sarah. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I, I, so I wonder if I should do this. Um, I've always hated the Philodemic Room, <laughs> uh, mostly because of the photo, of just this, the, I, I don't mind the, I love the ceiling, actually, and I don't mind the portraits, but the photographs, 
around the room just were terrible. I think they were just awful. And um, most of the people, like, we don't know and really don't care who they were. And some of them are bad. So you can get, nobody will shed a tear. A few people will shed a tear um, over removing a few of them. And they can be <laughs> replaced by some really interesting, cool, important orators who actually were eloquent in the defense Frederick of liberty. Douglas. Frederick Douglass, for one. Um, I just, there was a Twitter... Uh, the, I think some 19th century Americanists in literature just did the March Madness uh, with like great literary figures from the 19th century. And the final, the final was Melville, Melville's Moby Dick against Douglas's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. Douglas clearly wins. Hmm. It was really close. <laughs> But a five-minute well, speech to a thousand-page book. Know. We could debate. We could use, this is a philodemic system. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Anyway, but the point is, like, yes, put, first of all, Douglas was the, the most photographed man of the 19th century. Right. So put a photograph of Douglas in the room. It's not that hard. Yeah. Like, and it'll, you know. And Melville. It'll liven things up a little bit. Like He's not the only one. Like yeah. 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 yeah, I will clarify to our panelists that we did vote uh, to put some kind of representation of Frederick Douglass in our, in oh, our, yes. in our room exciting. last December, so, yeah. yes. Um, okay, uh, <coughs> Lena, go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna stand up because I'm short. And um, <laughs> Professor Rothman, I also really don't like the Philodemic Room, but I think it's because the color scheme is very garish. Um, uh, it's aesthetic, but, <laughs> it's really aesthetic on my part. Um, but my question is, now there's plenty of Philodemetians here who are part of the committee and they're here because they care and they came out of their own volition because they want to see us change the future of the Philodemic Society for the, for the better and we want to grapple with history. But there's also a lot of faces that I don't see here and some people have extenuating circumstances but I think that there's this difficult reality we have to face that a lot of people don't want to face the reality of our history and they don't want to move forward and they're unwilling to accept that it's time to make progress. How are we supposed to motivate people that are unwilling to care? And is there even room for them in making room for progress? Is there room for people who are like less engaged with this work? Well, I think that, you know, um, part of your <laughs> society's call is to have robust debate. And so hearing different points of view I is fundamental to the work that you're doing. I think that you should grapple with this issue as a, as a party of the whole and then figure out how you want to move forward. It's exciting to see that you're already making some progress. I don't think that success requires that everyone agree to everything. And so listening with your whole selves to other folks sometimes can be sufficient to keeping your society whole, even if the group decides to make a different decision. But I do think that one of the hardest things we can do as a democracy is try to listen to each other. And so just creating space and empathy for other points of view, even though the society seems to be moving in a different direction, I think can be helpful. Any other thoughts? Great. Okay. So Given time, I'm sorry, um, we are going to have to end our panel. Um, thank you so much to these wonderful guests. Um, Sidia Hartman uh, in Lose Your Mother writes about how there are afterlives of slavery and that slavery is something that has remnants in our modernity. And that's what makes the work of this committee and Philodemic, I think, so important is reconciling with those afterlives, both in terms of racism and racial inequality, um, but also in terms of the physical spaces that we exist in. So thank you so much uh, for speaking to all of us. Um, we're going to take a short break and then we're going to have a, a discussion about what we just heard. Um, yeah, you guys are welcome to stick around for that. You can also leave. Um, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you.